Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Many of you know that, you know, we're traveling a lot to, to, to Mexico. Not just Mexico, other parts of the world as well, but mainly Mexico. And, um, and when you go to Mexico, especially Oaxaca, it's the poorest state of all the states of Mexico. And Mexico is huge. Just Mexico City alone has 27 million people living just in the city. 27 million. That's a lot of people, man. And you want to see, we, you want to complain about traffic? Trust me, go to Mexico, you'll never complain again. It's like literally, what normally takes five to ten minutes to get to uh, a, a part of the town will take you an hour and a half to two hours to get there. Because the traffic is horrendous. Anyways, so Oaxaca, Mexico is, is, is the poorest state. And, you know, I've been to some pretty impoverished communities. But, man, some of the communities I've been to in Oaxaca have been just gut-wrenching. Like, you get there and you're just like, God, how do these people live? I mean, we're talking, they're living in trash dumps. And, and their, their homes are, are made up of metal and cardboard and, 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 and wood and and it's just, it's sad because then you walk into the house and it's this small, it's just a room. And most of these rooms have anywhere from four to five beds where everyone sleeps, eats. They, there's like no privacy whatsoever. And, and it's heartbreaking. And of course, you know what, I always do my best to be very honorable and respectful. Uh, one of the issues I have is I'm very germophobic. You know, so God's had to deliver me a lot from stuff. You know what I'm saying? And so I walk into these homes and, and you know, they're like, you know, there's like couches that look like they have fleas, lies, and you name it. It's just like holes in it and you don't know what you're going to sit on. And, um, and, and, and this has happened plenty of times, but I, I, I'll never forget this one house I walked into where the short, and listen, Oaxaca people, if you're short, go to Oaxaca. Your ego will just rise because, man, I'll tell you, they're short, like short. And uh, like short, you know, <laughs> I feel like a basketball player when I go there, like this Mexican, you know, Air Jordan, Michael Jordan guy. I just, I just feel so tall. But uh, this sweet, short little lady, you know, says to me, mijo, ben, ben, means come, come. And so we're in the house and, and she goes, quieres algo de tomar? And, and that means, do you want something to drink? Now, mind you, let me just FYI. Um, and our missions team is going in March this coming 2019. One thing about Hispanic women in Mexico, and I'm sure that's a lot of Latin America, um, you never say no to food. To say no to a mother, oh, you better watch it. It ain't going to go good for you. A grandmother, heck to the no. You could say, I already ate, and it would be so dishonorable, disrespectful, and painful to those people. And so, you know, I walk in the house, and I'm looking around, and it's like, ¿Quieres algo de tomar? Oh, I'm like, man... And, and just to honor her, I said, I said, okay, see, sí, yes, I'll, I'll take something. So she goes to, you know, her, her counter. And, and I know a lot of you think kitchen, it's probably like the counter in my, in, in my, in my house with the, the kitchen and, and the countertops and, and the sink. No, 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 no. Her counter was this little makeshift wood table that was all unbalanced and, and, and dirty and nasty. And, and she just picks up the cup from there. And you're probably thinking, well, I'm sure she probably washed it in her sink. No, her sink was the bucket of water with a dirty towel sticking out and and so she brings me the cup right and this cup is from Oaxaca how about that and so she brings me a cup and the moment she hands it to me you know germophobic boop all the alarms go off right like okay check it so I'm like you know like oh and it's stained and dirty and and then I'm like looking inside I'm like oh my god there's like little lint and stuff inside of it and you know before I can go like this you know and start like wiping it down she comes and she pours the water inside and now it's like oh lord Jesus you know <laughs> I got to get it. And you know what? And, and of course, I feel like doing this, you know, like. <laughs> but she's there the whole time, so you can't do that. So I'm just like, okay, you know what, man? I covered this with the blood. I start praying in tongues, the whole, you name it, man. You know, and I'm just like, all right, man. You know, the Bible says everything you do, you do it unto Jesus, right? You know, and, and listen, and sometimes you got to take one for Team Jesus. And so, of course, you know, it, it was, it, it, I felt like gagging. But, but I went ahead, out of honor and respect to her, I drank, I don't know what the heck I drank in there. <laughs> I don't know if it was dirty water, clean water, if you know, everyone in the house is sharing the bottle. I don't know, but, but I drank it. But you know what I thought about 
was, it made me think about the story of Jesus 2,000 years ago in the Garden of Gethsemane. It made me think about when he was given a cup. And when he was given this cup, he prayed to God at that moment and he said, Father, if it is possible, if you can do anything, would you please take this cup away from me? Would you allow this cup to pass me by? But not my will, your will be done. And it made me think about that because, you know what, I felt that way as well. Like, oh, Lord, can you just let this cup pass me by? Please let this cup pass me by. You know, let it just fall out of my hands or something. But as you think about this moment where Jesus is in agony, Jesus is in pain in this garden, Jesus is experiencing some major torment and turmoil have you ever asked yourself the question? Have you ever wondered, I wonder what was in his cup? Because yes, we preached the cross. Yes, we preached the garden. But what was in the cup that he was asking God the Father if he can just let this cup pass him by? What must have been in that cup? What was in his cup like was in my cup? And I promise you, his cup looked nothing like my cup. Mine just had some lint, maybe some hair. I don't know. His had our sins, our pride, our lust of the flesh, our lust of the eyes, our, our, our egos, our, our darkness, our, our lies, our deception. Just think about every filth, every dirt, Everything, it was a mixed drink of the spirit of this world. And Jesus was looking at this. Why would he say, Father, if it is possible, can this cup pass me by? I'll tell you why. Because you're talking about not a man. You're talking about a savior. You're talking about the angel of the Lord coming to Mary and telling her his name is Emmanuel. He is God with us. So he's a holy God. He's a pure God. He's a harmless God. God. He is a righteous God, and now all he knows is kingdom, and now he's on this earth where all the mud that you and I live on, the mess that you and I create, the sin that we practice, he is now looking in this cup and saying, this is what the Father said when he said, drink. Drink. Toma, mijo. Look at your neighbor and say, drink. If you want to go Spanish, that's fine with me. Toma lo hijo. Toma la hija. Drink it, girl. And so, and so just think, think about the cup that Jesus had to drink. The cup that you, you and I are that cup. Filled with, with dirt, filled with, with sin, filled with, with, with filth and, and, and stuff that you and I have done. And Jesus was, was in that garden and just saying, Father, if it's possible. But at the end of all of it, Jesus said, you know what? It's not about what I want. It's about what you want me to do, Father. Let me tell you something. The cup I'm asking you that you should be drinking of is the cup of reaching people with the glory of God. Because let me tell you something. You and I know family members, friends, co-workers, that when you look at their cup, they'll give you a cup of something, all right? And sometimes it's a cup of pain, a cup of, of, of hurt, a, a cup of, of, of rebellion, a cup of rejection, a cup of, of, of failing you, lying to you, cheating you and let me tell you something and that's the cup that Jesus has given us do you realize that the the foundation of every single believer is found in the great commission go ye into all the world and you preach this gospel like there's no possible way that you and I can read this bible and not read the life of Jesus and always looking and seeking to save those that are lost and far away from God. 
There is no way you can read this Bible or be connected to Jesus and not have the same compassion that Jesus has to reach broken people. There is no possible way. When we lose sight, and we have that temptation right now, especially in the world that we live in today, the temptation for Christians, believers, is to, to come to the place where even we don't even believe in heaven or hell. Now, you may say, no, wait, 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 wait. I do believe in heaven. But here's the truth. If we believed in heaven so much, then we would have a heavy conviction and a heavy compassion and a heavy passion to reach people and save people from a place called hell. Now, in church, you don't hear sermons no more about hell. Have you noticed when you hear, I, I double dog dare you this week, listen to a lot of sermons. You will not hear the word Satan. You will not hear the word devil anymore. You won't hear it no more. You hear enemy. But the enemy you hear is the enemy who hurt you, and they bring it back to people. I'm not here to dog churches. I'm not, trust me, I'm not. I'm just here to remind us and to confront us with the truth that there is a devil. There is a Satan. He comes in John 10, 10. Jesus straight up said it. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. He comes to place us in bondage. He comes to destroy our families. He comes to destroy our life. He comes to steal your dream, your vision, your purpose, your destiny. But Jesus said, hey, but hey. he's like, I'm not going to give him all that glory. He says, but I came to give you life and life more abundantly. That's our Jesus. That is our Jesus. But there's no possible way that you and I can read this Holy Bible. There's no possible way that you can read the story or the life of Jesus and not have compassion for lost people. There's no way. If, if that does not burden you, if that does not burn in your heart, then there is a problem with the church. Then we have lost sight of what Jesus is to us. We have lost purpose we have cheapened our salvation. And it's sad when we cheapen our salvation. When you cheapen your salvation is when you forget the value and the worth of what Jesus did for you and me. Do you remember when you were addicted? Do you remember when you were lost and broken? Do you remember when you were in your darkest place in life? Do you remember when you were that drug addict, that alcoholic? Do you remember when you were that cheater, that liar? Do you remember when you were that hater? And yet God loved you so much that it didn't matter how dirty your cup was, he was still willing to drink it? Huh? What happened to the church? Where is the church? Say with me, I'm the church. You can't just keep going to work and just seeing people go to hell. Let me give you some stats before I do that. Let me give you a verse. You guys ready? Are you guys here today? Okay, say that with me. What's in your cup? Awesome. All right. Yeah, I have a cup, a whole lot of people, my cup. Okay, go to Luke 19.10. Look at this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to what? Save that which was lost. Okay, so the Son of Man, his focus, his number one priority, what burdened him every single day, what drove him every day was to do the will of the Father, which was, which was to seek and save that which was lost and we see that he done that not did that now watch this the latest stats say now mind you this is just the stats on people that have rejected christ stats show that 125,000 people die and go into eternity who never receive jesus christ every single day that means that today this sunday 125,000 people will die without knowing our Lord and our Savior. Stats. Now, mind you, now that doesn't even include the number of people that know him that die every single day. If you times 125,000 people per day and you were to times that by seven days a week, that's 846,000 thousand people that die every single week your your co-workers family members friends people that you and i know that are dying without christ every single week you times that by four weeks that's 3.5 million people a month that die without knowing jesus christ you times that by 12 months that's 42 million people that never hear the gospel or rejected the gospel and have died and now are in eternity into a place called hell. Now, I don't know about you. 
I don't think it's right when we work with people closely that respect us, that love us, family members that, that we, we know are far away from God, and there is no burden or conviction or any compelling love inside of us to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. That's a big number, isn't it? Today, 125,000 people will go somewhere for eternity. This specific number is 125,000 people will go to hell. I know we don't want to talk about that on Christmas, huh? But isn't that the reason for the season? Isn't that why God, for God so, I mean, we quote it. John 3, 16, let's all say it together. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Right? I mean, that's the whole why we celebrate Christmas. It's the reason for this season. Look at this. So what is what happens? The, here's what Proverbs 24, 11 says. It says, deliver those who are drawn toward death. And hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Deliver those who, who are stumbling, who are drawn to death. And he says, and hold back. Everybody say, hold back. He says, you are responsible to deliver and hold people back. Because today, people are literally stumbling into hell. Just stumbling. And we all stumble, don't we? All of us here in this room, we stumble at some point. That's why we need the body. We need the church. So when you're stumbling, someone can hold you back that's being drawn to death. That's what the church is for. We're there to hold each other up. We're there to encourage and build each other up, not expose you, not, not call you out, not shame you, but to love you and say, hey, I'm going to hold you back from that. Not just for the house, but we're talking about people that are far away from God. He says, you deliver them. He says, deliver. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those who are stumbling. Look at what verse 12 says. He says, if you say, surely, we didn't know this. I don't know I'm supposed to do anything, Pastor. What's wrong with you? Oh, praise God. Aren't you glad you came to church on Sunday? Now you know. <laughs> surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? God weighs the heart. And he says, and he who keeps your soul, does he not know it? Think about it, guys. We have a soul. Your family has a soul. Your children have a soul. Your coworkers have a soul. Every person that you come across in this world has a soul. And that soul is going somewhere. And God has given us the mandate. God has anointed the church, you and me. God has given us the primary assignment to be the evangelist of this world. And many of us don't do it because we're afraid of rejection. We should be more afraid of people going to hell than being rejected. I'd rather feel a little rejection for a moment than to see someone burn for for eternity and forever and ever. And listen, if you don't like this, that means that you don't like the Bible because the Bible is very clear what Jesus came to save us from. I don't know what gospel you came up with. I don't know what's, what, what you've been reading, but the Bible is very clear. Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. I came to set the captives free. I came to save the lost. I came to seek and to save. Now, in other words, Jesus says, man, I'm looking for you. The church needs to be looking for people that need a savior, that need healing, that need uh, help. And he says, so, so he who keeps your soul, does not, does, doesn't he know it? And look, I love this part. And he says, and, and, and will he not render to each man according to his deeds? In other words, when you and I have this, this compassion of Jesus, when, when you and I have this heart of Jesus, when you and I have taken the mandate of saying, you know what, I'm going to reach people for Jesus, what ends up happening is that God, he pays you back. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing more than to see someone come to Christ. It just fills you up. Like there's this, this sense of enjoyment, excitement. Like if you're always this emotional roller coaster, I'll tell you why, because it's always about you. It's just the attention's on you. So here's a little nugget. Get the attention off you. How do I do that? 
Go and love on people. Go and reach people, and you'll think less of you. Isn't that what Paul said? I die to me daily, right? We die to selfie, and it's a selfie generation, isn't it, right? It's not just our selfie this. It's selfie every day, right? You look in the mirror, it's selfie. Everything's about me, 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 me. It's a me generation. Well, the only way to take that attention off of you is to put it on others who need Jesus. I promise you, it'll bless your life. Uh, and, and we have to understand, I think many times we think we're afraid because of people's intellect. You know, like people are afraid to share with people that are very in intelligent. But let me just remind you of something. Intelligence doesn't open the door to heaven for anyone. Money. Oh, I can't talk to them. They got, I'm poor. They're rich. Let me tell you something. Money cannot buy anyone into heaven. Influence cannot get anyone into heaven. Power cannot get anyone into heaven. I don't care if you're the president of the United States, if you're the king or the queen of England. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much power you have, how much influence, how much money. The only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. He must be saved. She must be saved. And that is the bottom line. Are you hearing me? We must understand that. How do I know that? Well, think about it. If you read your Bible, you read the story of, remember Zacchaeus, that little short dude? Zacchaeus in the Bible was someone who was wicked. He was in darkness. He was a liar, a cheater. Man, he was robbing people from their money. They're fine. He was a tax collector. And so Zacchaeus, you know, he, he saw all this, this, the, these crowds, and he was like, what the heck is going on here? And so Zacchaeus starts running, but because he was so short, he went and he ran up a sycamore tree. And as he was on the sycamore tree, he couldn't wait to see Jesus pass by. But Jesus, you know, being who he is, he was a friend of sinners. He walks by and he sees that sinner. And he stops and he looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, man, what's up? Now, mind you. Zacchaeus wasn't like, whoa, the healer, the deliverer. Oh, no. Zacchaeus, let me tell you something. That brother was an entrepreneur. Man, he was looking at, at his Instagram followers, his Facebook followers, his Twitter followers. He's looking at all the crowds thinking, money, money. I better invite this guy into my business, and maybe we can have an investment, you know, gathering, and we can do. That's what he was thinking. But let me tell you something. But when you meet Jesus... There's a holy reverence, a conviction that literally makes you feel and, and, and experience something that's greater than you and me. If you've never experienced that, you need to find Jesus. But I've been a believer for many years. Then maybe you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. Because it's easy to draw from the truth. So easy, especially in this culture we live in today. So Zacchaeus... Man, all of a sudden, he went from being Mr. Entrepreneur, being Mr. Man, I can get something for him, to like, whoa. And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. And Zacchaeus was like, what? And, of course, you saw all the religious people, all of the, his disciples were ticked off at Jesus. Like, why are you going to Zacchaeus' house, man? You don't know where this dude's been? Jesus like, I got to go drink a cup. I'll be right back. And he sits in the house of Zacchaeus. And you know what he tells Zacchaeus? He tells Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your home. And all his family got saved. So Jesus went. He, not, he didn't only go to the down and outer. He went to the up and outers too. They need Jesus too. Don't ever be like, oh, I can never talk to them. What? Then you have cheapened your salvation as if any money, any amount of money is greater than the salvation that God paid for you and I to have eternity with him. You can't think like that. I mean, think about, remember the prostitute? Jesus walks 36 miles to go meet a prostitute at the well. 36 miles. Now, if you ever complain about, this church is too far to drive. <laughs> Man, I will bring scripture to you so fast. It's amazing, our culture, huh? It's just too far. It's too far. God went further. And he always goes further, right? So don't ever have that mindset. This is too far. Man, he walked 36 miles just to go meet a woman at a well who was a prostitute. And his heart was to not only save her, his heart was to save her. And through her, she saved the entire town for Jesus. Are you hearing me? 
So, so when, you, when you talk about it's Jesus, we're talking about a Savior who just does anything to reach people. Look at Luke 9, 26. says this. Jesus replied. Here's another suppose. Are you ready for another suppose? He goes, let's pretend. Let's suppose you start to plow, and then you look back. So in other words, let's suppose, let's suppose that you start strong with God. Man, I'm all in it to win it, right? Man, you know how when you first get saved, you got the butterflies. You're telling everybody about Jesus. You're sharing your faith. You're so excited to tell them how God saved you, how God delivered you. But let's just suppose, he says, let's suppose you started that way. And so you're focused. You're, you're like, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You're singing all the songs. You've memorized the lyrics. And it's been just awesome.com, right? It's been amazing. But what happens with us? You know what happens with us? Life happens. Distractions happen. Uh, relationships happen. Uh, hurts happen. All kinds of stuff. Offenses happen. Drama happens. And so what happens with the church, and this is what we're seeing in, 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 in the body of Christ today, the body of Christ is so distracted with so many things that we go from this to this. And here the scripture says, Jesus says, let's just suppose you start to plow. In other words, you're plowing the gospel. You're bringing the word. You're, you're, you're living for Christ. You're following Christ. You're, you're pursuing Christ. You're, you're pursuing people. You're carrying the mandate God gave you. This isn't for the pastor or the minister. The mandate has been given to anyone who is called a believer, a Christian. And he says, if you do, you are not fit for service in God's kingdom. And I know that's hard to swallow because you know what? We came to church, pastor, to be built up. We came to be tickled. And that's cool. We'll laugh. We'll have fun. But, but this is the words of Jesus. Think about this. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember when that, that city was so filled with, with sin and darkness and prostitution and incest and all kinds of stuff. And here you have Lot and his wife. God graces them, shows them mercy, is willing to save them. And he tells them, okay, here's what you do. All I need you to do is when you leave Sodom and Gomorrah, when you leave your past, when you leave the sin, when you leave everything, I don't want you to look back. And what do they do? He's looking. So he's like, man, girl, don't look back. Don't look back. And she's like, one more time. No, don't look back. Don't look back. And what happens? She just couldn't. She's like, like uh, he's like holding her head like, don't do it. And, and she does what? She turns back and she turns into what? A pillar of salt. Jesus is bringing that attention. Suppose that you do start right. Suppose that you are, your hands are in the plow. Suppose that you are reaching people. Suppose that you were, you were in it to see people's lives change and transform. But then, but then you look back. What is, he, what is he saying in this verse? He's basically saying, do you remember when you reached souls a year ago or three years ago? Do you remember maybe five years ago when you were passionate about seeing people come to Christ like you came to Christ? Do you remember when you used to love sharing what God did in your life and all of a sudden you stopped doing it? And the only reason people stop doing it is because they're looking back. It's so easy to be caught up with offense and drama in our life. And we no longer make it about Jesus, just like Christmas. It's so easy to take Christmas and you just make it about vacations, Christmas gifts, parties, food, which is awesome. Man, get every gift you want. I've already given my list, and I checked it twice. That's great, but not at the expense of cheapening the whole purpose and the meaning of why we're even celebrating Christmas. This is a glorious and joyous time to share life with people that are broken and hurting right now. This is our opportunity. There have been people that have come to Christ at our church service on our Christmas services, two of them specifically in the last three years, one of them on Christmas Day that we had a service on Christmas Day. We're not having one this year on Christmas Day. But on Christmas Day, this gentleman came to know Christ. And this guy had a, uh, I mean, you want to look at his cup? His cup was filled with junk. But he came to a church service. Someone invited him to church. He comes to church. God touches him. God impacts his life so much. He's crying here at the front altar, and he's weeping, and he's saying, I've never experienced this love. The guy was in and out of prison all his life, addicted to drugs, all kinds of stuff, messed up. On that Christmas day, he receives Christ. He's joyous. He's happy. He goes home. His neighbor's being robbed. 
he goes and for the first time does something he's never done before, help another human being. He helps the guy from being robbed and hurt. The guy who was robbing that guy ends up killing him. 125,000 people today don't know Jesus are going somewhere for eternity. Does that move you? Does that even bother you? I wonder if the people you work with, I wonder where they're going. I wonder, I wonder if they're going to heaven. I wonder if they're going to hell. Have, you have to ask yourself that question. If not, then you've come up with your own gospel. And that's dangerous because you're, you start doing church the way you like it and not church the way he called you to be. And we see a lot of church the way we like it in this culture today. It's how I like it. That's my jam. It, it, everything has to fit my me. Or we take a break, like, wow. Or we say, you know what, I've, Pastor, I've been a Christian for 45 years. <laughs> I've done my part. <laughs> if you think you've done your part, then go home to be with the Lord. Of course you wouldn't want to go home to be with the Lord, right? You'd be like, what are you, whoa. I mean, if I'm on this earth, I got things to do. How about you? I don't care if you're 99 years old. If you're alive, you got strength in your body, praise God and keep winning people to Jesus. Come on. God says, you build my house, I build your house. And the house he's talking about is the temple, this body. He will keep you strong, I promise you. I'm going to set this video up. I want you to pay attention to this. I know the guys um, that's narr narrating the story, and it's a true story. Um, I think he's British or, or, or Ozzy. I don't know what he is, but it's hard to understand sometimes. Um, I want you to pay attention, put everything down, because I promise you, you'll be inspired. It's a true story, and you'll, you'll be inspired. You'll be, you'll be motivated again. If you haven't been motivated, I promise you, you will leave motivated today with Jesus. So watch this. A number of years ago, in a Baptist church in Crystal Palace in southern London, the Sunday morning service was closing, and a stranger stood up at the back, raised his hand, he said, Excuse me, Pastor. Can I share a little testimony? The pastor looked at his watch. He said, you've got three minutes. And this man proceeded. He said, I've just moved into this area. I used to live in another part of London. I came from Sydney in Australia. And just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives. And I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney? It runs from the business hub out to the rocks, the colonial area. And he said, a strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway, put a pamphlet in my hand, and he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astounded by those words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously, and all the way on British Airlines, back to Heathrow, this puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in this new area, where I'm living now, and thank God he was a Christian. He led me to Christ, and I'm a Christian, and I want a fellowship here. And Baptists love testimonies like it. Everyone applauded and welcomed him into the fellowship. That Baptist pastor flew to Adelaide in Australia the next week, and ten days later, in the middle of a three-day series in a Baptist church in Adelaide, a woman came to him for counseling, and he wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. And she said, I used to live in Sydney. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends in Sydney, doing some last-minute shopping down George Street, and a strange little white-haired man, elderly man, stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pamphlet, and said, excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church was on the next block from me, and I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ. So, sir, I'm telling you that I am a Christian. Now, this London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice, within a fortnight, he'd heard the same testimony. He then flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for a meal. And he said, mate, how'd you get saved? He said, I grew up in this church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. Never made a commitment to Jesus, just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. And because of my business ability, grew up to a place of influence. I was on a business outing in Sydney just three years ago, and an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a stop shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet, cheap junk, and accosted me with a question. Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, I was seething with anger all the way home on Qantas to, to Perth. He said, I told my pastor, thinking he would sympathize with me, and my pastor agreed. He had been disturbed for years 
knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and he was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. Now, this London preacher flew back to the UK and was speaking at the Keswick Convention in the Lake District. And he threw in these three testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, four elderly pastors came up and said, we got saved between 25 and 35 years ago, respectively, through that little man on George Street giving us a tract and asking us that question. He then flew the following week to a similar Keswick Convention in the Caribbean, to missionaries. And he shared the testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, three missionaries came up and said, we got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through that little man's testimony and asking us that same question on George Street in Sydney. Coming back to London, he stopped outside Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at a naval chaplain's convention. And when his three days of revving these naval chaplains up, over a thousand of them, in soul winning, the chaplain general took him out for a meal. And he said, how did you become a Christian? He said, well, it was miraculous. I was a rating on a United States battleship, and I lived a reprobate life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific, and we docked in Sydney Harbor for replenishments. We hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I got on the wrong bus, got off in George Street. And <laughs> as I got off the bus, I thought it was a ghost. This elderly, white-haired man jumped in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my hand, and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, the fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober and ran back to the battleship, sought out the chaplain. The chaplain led me to Christ. And I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am in charge of over a thousand chaplains and we're bent on soul winning today. That London preacher, six months later, flew to do a convention for 5,000 Indian missionaries in a remote corner of northeastern India. And at the end... The Indian missionary in charge, a humble little man, took him home to his humble little home for a simple meal. And he said, how did you, as a Hindu, come to Christ? He said, I was in a very privileged position. I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission. And I traveled the world. And I am so glad for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin, because I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I got into. He said, one bout of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. And I was doing some last-minute shopping laden with parcels of toys and clothing for my children, walking down George Street. And this courteous little white-haired man stepped out in front of me, offered me a pamphlet, and said, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to my town, I sought out the Hindu priest, and he couldn't help me. But he gave me some advice. He said, just to satisfy your curious mind, nothing else, go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road. And that was fatal advice. He said, because that day the missionary led me to Christ, I quit Hinduism immediately, and then began to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service, and here I am, by God's grace, in charge of all these missionaries, and we are winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Well, eight months later... That Crystal Palace Baptist pastor was ministering in Sydney, in Gymea, southern suburb of Sydney. And he said to the Baptist minister, do you know a little man, an elderly little man who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? And he said, I do. His name is Mr. Genor, G-E-N-O-R. But I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. The man said, I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went around to this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He sat them down, made them some tea, and he was so frail he was slopping tea into the saucer as he shook. And as he sat with them, this London preacher told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man sat with tears running down his cheeks. He said, my story goes like this. He said, I was a rating on an Australian warship, and I lived a reprobate life. And in a crisis, I really hit the wall, and one of my colleagues whom I gave literal hell was there to help me. He led me to Jesus, and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. And I was so grateful to God. I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day. As God gave me strength. Sometimes I was ill, I couldn't do it, but I made up for it for other times. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I have done this for over 40 years. And in my retirement years, the best place was on George Street. There were hundreds of people. I got lots of rejections. But a lot of people courteously took the tracks. And he said, in 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until today. Do you know, I would say that has to be commitment. 
That has to be just sheer gratitude and love for Jesus to do that, not hearing of any results. Margarita did a little count. That's 146,100 people. That simple little non-charismatic Baptist man influenced somehow to Jesus. And I believe what God was showing, that Baptist minister was the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of this iceberg. Goodness knows how many more had been arrested for Christ and were doing huge jobs out in the mission field. Mr. Genor died two weeks later. And can you imagine the reward he went home to in heaven? I doubt if his face would ever have appeared on Charisma magazine. I doubt if there would ever have been a write-up with a photograph in Billy Graham's Decision magazine, as beautiful as those magazines are. Nobody except a little group of Baptists in southern Sydney knew about Mr. Genor, but I'll tell you his name was famous in heaven. Heaven knew Mr. Genor, and you can imagine the welcome and the red carpet and the fanfare he went home to when he arrived in glory. Come on, is that awesome or what? Wow. You heard most of the time he was rejected, but you know, there were times where people would just take the pamphlet and you heard the ugly horrible pamphlet and the simple question if you were to die today do you know where where you would end up do you know if you would go to heaven a very thought-provoking question obviously and 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 his commitment listen his salvation was full conversion it wasn't a hey yeah i received christ yeah i know jesus it wasn't a very casual and isn't that the issue with christians said it's just very casual it's a casual faith it's a casual relationship. It's very just, you know, like, don't mess with me, man. And, and listen, no one's messing with you. But when you have been touched by heaven, when you have met Jesus, something on the inside of you compels you to want to do what this man did. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do the same exact thing, but, but there should be some, some markings in our life. There should be some lives in our lifetime that can say, hey, if it wasn't for you, I will know Jesus today. Thank you for introducing me to Jesus. You know, if it wasn't for you. Now, I know that many of us think that we need to seal the deal. We need to lead everybody to Christ. Well, guess what? That's not the way it works. Just read the Bible. The Bible says that some are just the seed planters. Maybe you'll be like this guy, the greatest seed planter for 40 years. And for him, he always thought like, man, I was unproductive. But notice, but he was committed. He never stopped. And two weeks before he died, he found out the impact of what he had on this earth, all because he was the seed planter. And then there's those other people that come in, they're the waters, right? Maybe you're the one that's just going to water someone's seed that has already been planted. But the Bible says at the end of the day, have you noticed when, have you seen those people, they're just like the greatest soul winners, like, man, I led someone in Christ, I led someone, and you're just like, man, I'm a sucky disciple, I'm a sucky Christian follower. They win everybody, I win nobody. No, it's not that they're awesome.com, it's that, you know what? They got the easy part. They didn't plant the seed. They didn't water it. They're just getting the increase. The people are like, yes, how mu what must I do to be saved? And it's like, wow, that's the way the kingdom works. It's a farming system. You know what? Some just plant the seed. Others will go by. You'll water it. But at the end of the day, God gets all the increase, and we can't hold back. There's a man named Edwin Burke said this, the only way for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing, to do nothing. That brings me to the story in Ezekiel 3. Read it for sake of time. Read it on your own. Ezekiel 3 is the story of the watchmen. And in these times, they would put watchmen on the walls who would basically be like the security system of today. And they were just watching and looking for any, uh, any danger that was coming to them. And if the watchman saw danger coming, his primary job was to alert the community. And give them an opportunity to fight back and to not die but to live. But just think about this. What if the watchman did nothing when the enemy was coming? What if the watchman said nothing, did nothing, didn't care to reach out to the community? What if the watchman saw the danger and just got too lazy? He's like, well, I I'm not feeling it right now because when the watchman would see the enemy coming, he'd have to go and, 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 and uh, blow the horn and, and, and wake everybody up and then everybody goes to fight. But what if 
Not even that. What if he didn't even want to wake them up and tell them, hey, danger's on its way, danger's on its way. When you study the scripture in this story in Ezekiel 3, the Bible says that the watchman was not only responsible to make them aware of danger and to deliver them from destruction, but the Bible said that if the watchman failed to do his job and if anyone was killed, that their blood would be on their hands. That's pretty deep. God is calling us to have the mandate to be the watchman of this time. And when you see people that are far away from God, lost and broken and, and literally just in depression, oppression, you have the name that's above every name. You have the answer to their healing. You, you have the answer to their restoration. You have the name that's above every name. And for us to just sit back and watch and let people die, not knowing your Lord, our Savior, would not be right. It's not right. Say it, I'm the watchman. Yeah. We're the watchmen. And if you're here today and you're someone that, man, I'm not a Jesus person. Like, I just came to church because I was invited today and promised some food afterwards. Well, let me tell you something. Maybe you've had some bad experiences with Christianity. Maybe you've had a bad experience with a Christian. I want to apologize on behalf of all Christians. Not everyone's the same. Not every Christian is the same. But let me tell you something. Take your eyes off the man. Put your eyes on Jesus. Man will fail us, but God will never fail you. And if you have been hurt by the church, if you have, you know, felt ill about the church, I'm here to tell you that God loves you regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you've done. All God cares about is your eternity. He loves you. He's not against you. He's not mad at you. He's not holding grudges against you. He's not thinking anything negative about you. As a matter of fact, right now in this moment, God is thinking, I hope my son and daughter come to, to know me today. I hope they come to salvation today because salvation has met every single one of us this day. Last verse, look at this. Mark 5, 19, 20. It says, but Jesus said to him, this is after he saved someone. And, and the guy was so touched and he wanted to go with Jesus. But Jesus said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Read the whole story. The guy was so lost, man just destructive and he says go tell him what the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you verse 20 so the man went his way in the area known as the ten cities and he began to tell how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were what amazed they're like what you know they weren't amazed only on the story they were amazed on the transformation like dude I remember you girl I remember you you were never a nice person you were always mean and you know always had a sourpuss face like what, what happened to you definitely wasn't the facelift because I still see the wrinkles you know what I'm saying it's like man something happened internally in your heart that changed your life and they were all amazed and 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 let me tell you something um, we have a responsibility to hold back people from doom we have a responsibility to deliver people from stumbling to the slaughter we have a responsibility and I know and I get it because many of us are like well I've already shared my faith I've already shared Christ with my co-workers and my family members and my friends and they don't want nothing to do with God let me tell you something let me encourage you why don't you go back why don't you text back why don't you talk back? Why don't you go back again and again and again? And you just keep dropping. If all you do is plant seed and water for the next 30 years, you know what? So be it. My brother-in-law, okay, Geeke, who was a drug addict, alcoholic, and just messed up in his life. Let me tell you something. For 10 years, 10 years, there was moments I didn't even want to talk to him because, man, he was so rude and mean-hearted and man he would cuss me out but for 10 years just shared Jesus with him shared Jesus with him shared. and then one day I'll never forget it he walked into church and he gave his life to Jesus Christ I'm here to tell you you cannot even begin to question 
or to even think that you are the timetable of when someone's going to come to Christ. Your job is to carry the mandate and to be the watchman of the wall and to tell people, hey, listen, watch it. You know why? Because today, 125,000 people will go somewhere for eternity. And it's not fair for us just to sit back and not blow the whistle, to sit back and not ring the trumpet, to sit back and not at least say, hey, think about what you're about to do. Think about it. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The reason for Christmas, and I hope you never forget this, it's Jesus, nothing else. Everything else is the added blessing, but it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. He saves, he heals, he restores, he redeems, and everything else is just, let's go have some fun. But let's put Jesus at the center table this Christmas. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.